Okay, we're going to start. Come. So we're going to start today's Mustar topic is going to be, we usually generally start with the Mustar topic, and then afterwards we'll continue with the Alakha that we started with two weeks ago. So now we're going to, we're in the month of Tammuz, we're going to enter the three weeks between the 17th of Tammuz to Tisha B'Av, which these were the weeks, this, these were the weeks where the whole destruction of the Bet HaMikdash started. One of the things that the Gemara says that why the Bet HaMikdash was destroyed, I found it very important to speak about this topic. It's uh, a lot of people, as, you know, a lot of uh, rabbis will call it uh, a little hesitant to speak about this topic. But I'll speak about the topic. Shoot. Huh? Shoot. Shoot. Omar of Yehuda, the Gemara says, Lo charbaya Yerushalayim ele b'yishvir shebizu batam edi chachamim. It says, Yerushalayim was destroyed, you know why? Because they used to disgrace tam edi chachamim. They used to look down on b'nei Torah. B'nei Torah and tam edi chachamim were like, uh, we're not important people in their eyes. As it says, Vayum alevim b'malachei lokim b'ozim devarav mitatim b'biura adonochad. Kolam. It says that the Bet Megdash destroyed because of the disgrace of the Tam and the Chachamim. We have to understand exactly why, because we know that there was a lot of reasons the Gemara says. Lom Rabbi Yehuda, anybody that disgraces the Tam and Chacham, he has a makad that he has no rufwa. Meaning to say that such an individual is sickened to the point that he has no. He has no refua, he has no, uh, no cure to such an individual. Right? What does that mean? He brings a, a sefer called 807, he says, Kodesh Baruch Hu is more strict with the kavod of tzaddikim than his own kavod. That we find that people that disgraced Hashem weren't punished to the degree as people that disgraced Hamadi Chachamim. The Katav Sofa writes, why is it that Yerushalayim was destroyed because of the, because of the disgrace towards Tamini Chachamim? Like people don't care, right? Hello, he says, in that generation, the Gemara says they did Avodah Zarah, idol worship, right? How can that be? What? How can that be? How powerful. What do you mean, how can that be? Yes. I don't mean, like this. Gila they used to sleep around with women that are astur to them. Right? A lot of immorality. Shechut Damim, they used to murder people. Yeah, murder people. They used to literally murder people. How could it be that Chachamim tell us that the Bet HaMikdash is destroyed because of, of the disgrace towards Tamini Chachamim? The Gemara says they did such severe Averot. What does the disgrace of Tamini Chachamim have to do with anything? You know what the Katav Sover says? He says, even if the generation is wicked and they leave the Torah and they fulfill all the Tavot and they do all the Averot, Right? But he says over here, however, if they respect the Chachamim, if they still respect the Tamil Chachamim, there's hope that they'll change. There's hope that there'll be a different future. But, he says, if they already lost all their embarrassment towards the Chachamim, they really don't care about the rabbis. Like it says, who's considered Mechalel Shabbat before Hesia? What's the final breaking point? If he's still embarrassed in front of the rabbi. He could break Shabbat publicly, but if he sees the rabbi, he hides his cigarette, or he doesn't go in the car, he's embarrassed, he's embarrassed of Tamidi Chachamim, he's still not considered Mechalel Shabbat Mephrasi, because there's still hope that he's going to change. But, if such an individual doesn't already care, for him, same thing, he comes to the rabbi, he says, Rabbi, I don't see the difference between you and anybody else. Right? He's Mevazet Tamidi Chachamim, he looks at the rabbi like, like nothing. He says, the Iker, the main thing that was horrible with him, is the fact that they degraded Tamil Chachamim and they made fun of them like, what are they talking about like this, like that? Does this make sense to you? What's the difference between this? What's the difference between that? The rabbis are always saying something, right? Like the rabbis, they get up and say, you're not allowed to do this. Ah, what difference does it make? What's wrong with it? Who cares, right? Their own mind, their own understanding overrides whatever the Chachamim say. They couldn't care less for the, the, the mind of the Chachamim. He says such a people, when they're going to break out, of listening to the Chachamim, such a generation already has no hope. Such a generation slowly, slowly will start deteriorating. He says, as long as they didn't disgrace the Talmud and the Chachamim, Yerushalayim was not destroyed. Why? Because as wicked as they was, if they would see a rabbi, if you'd be able to change them, there would be hope. But once it got to the point where they couldn't even care for the Chachamim anymore, already got to a point where there's no hope for them to change. 
And that's why that was the breaking point of the destruction of the Beit Mikdash. And a lot of us don't realize that if if, if we don't value Rav Avig the Mili used to say that if you see a if you see a Ben Torah if you see a Frum Jew outside you should run up to him and hug him and kiss him. We don't realize the valuable assets that we have when we see Talmud Chachamim Bnei Torah around us. If the Talmud Chachamim and the Bnei Torah were to leave the community in 30 years from now, they would be sending chaz everywhere. Everybody would be like goyim. There would be nothing here. No yeshivot, no kolalim, no Torah, no nothing. If all the Talmud Chachamim leave, the the security of the future of all of Judaism is the Tamid Chamim and the Menei Torah. If they would all feel like, okay, this is not for us, we're all going to leave. If they feel like they're being degraded and belittled where they are, and they're going to leave, what's going to happen? You're destroying your own future. You're destroying your own communities. You're destroying it for your own children. That's eventually what's happening. If people don't realize the value of the Menei Torah developing in the communities, if they begin to degrade that area, what's going to happen is they're going to leave and then people are going to be left with nothing. You know what Rabbi Yashiv says? Rabbi Yashiv says, you know why there's so much suffering in this generation? Rabbi Yashiv says, this is in our generation. He passed away a few years ago. He says it's because this generation is sick with this sickness of disgracing Tamid Chachamim. People don't value the words of the Chachamim. For example, if there's something that's happening, and the Chachamim of the community get up and say, it's a surah to attend, it's a surah to be there, we're not allowed to go. Everybody should say, okay, these are the rabbis, they say, no, we don't go. But what happens a lot of times, unfortunately, it's not like that. Right? That's considered a busy for Tamil Chacham. The Shulchan Aruch writes, the Shulchan Aruch writes, Avon gadol ulevazot tamidi Chachamim. It's a, a Shulchan Aruch, it's a lachala maaset, it's a It says, anybody that disgraces tamidi Chachamim, he has no chilek in Olam Abba. He loses his share in Olam Abba. Once a person starts already, he doesn't care about what the rabbi said, doesn't care about anything. Such an individual, he says, he loses his chilek on Olam Abba, and even after he dies, they put him in Nidui. You know what Nidui means? Nobody can involve him in his burial, no nothing. They just put him in Khirim. The Rambam writes, a person that's Mabaza Tamil Chamim, he says, you know who? Generally, these are the people that love Tavod, they love Olam Hazem. They don't like that the, the rabbis do. The stipler Rabbi writes something very interesting. He says the Talmud Chachamim are the ones that transfer over the Emunah and the Masorah from generation to generation. And he says the people that deny what they represent is Kefira in the whole Emunah of Klal Yisrael. Because they are the ones that give over everything that we need for the new generation. And the Chazuni says look what happened 150 years ago. Where millions of Jews started to go off the derech and everybody started to become like Goyim. He says, if you go back to where did it all start, it all started from the people starting to become corrupt mentally and start to disagree with the Chachamim and start to put down the Tamil Chachamim and start to be malig, like the great, right, the Olam HaToram. It says in certain countries, I don't want to mention names, in certain countries, whenever there would be Bnei Torah, they would have to walk with their heads down because they would be so belittled. If they would find like a girl who's like in a wheelchair or something, they would say, this is for the Ben Torah. Like this, they would look at them like nothing. Right, they look at them, no, what are you going to do with your life? When are you going to go to work? When are you going to do this? Oh, you're only learning? They don't realize the value of the chashibut of Torah. They don't realize the value of the chashibut of a ben Torah. They don't realize that if it wouldn't be for people sitting and learning, there is no future for Klal Yisrael. If there wouldn't be for the Tamil Chamim all day learning and teaching and going around and bringing people close to Hashem, there would not be no future anywhere. Right, eventually, everything would end up like, uh, like Goim Chas Shalom. The Divr Chaim writes, the Shud Devei Chaim is one of the big Gidolim uh, from about like 200 years ago around. He says that there was one Melamed, there was one teacher in a school. He got up and he said to the, t- to the kids that the Or Chaim HaKadosh, she didn't write a Sefer Ruach HaKadosh. That Sefer was not written in Ruach HaKadosh. Everybody knows the Or Chaim HaKadosh. Everybody knows that the Or Chaim HaKadosh, his Sefer, he wrote it to Ruach HaKadosh. His full Ruach HaKadosh with a Sefer. He wrote it to divine inspiration fully. He was so holy he was on such a high madrega, everything was written fully with divine inspiration, Siyat Deshmaya. And he says, the Divrei Chaim says it's not true. He says the Chachamim, even nowadays, if the Chachamim are very mezukach, if they stick to the Torah and they're of the Hashem, he says they can reach the levels of Ruch HaKodesh. And he brings the Ramban and the Rambam that say that there is Ruch HaKodesh. And he says, the person who denies the Ruch HaKodesh to Chamim is considered an Apikorus. And he told the people, don't go to this Malamed, don't even learn by him. The Gemara says, 
A lot of people say, no, nowadays the rabbis are not like the way they were before. It's not true. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives in every generation. The Tamid HaChamim, they need for that generation. The Gemara says in every single generation, there's 36 people in every single generation that, this, that see the Shekhinah every day. Believe that? And every single generation, the Gemara says, there are 36 Chachamim in that generation that see the Shekhinah every single day. That means in this generation, there are people that see the Shekhinah every single day. Which Gemara is this? I don't remember, it could be Irvin. Right? That every single day there are 36 Chachamim. And he says over here that who's considered a Tamil Chacham? What in Halakha is considered a Tamil Chacham? It's the big gather. What's considered a Tamil Chacham? He says, Kataba Rosh, a Kataba Tur. The Tur writes based on what the Rosh told him. The Rosh lived about 850 years ago, something like that. Rav Yitzchak Yosef writes that the Rosh was such a big posek, there was a certain time frame where all of Klal Yisrael, Sephardim and Ashkenazim, everybody used to follow the Pesachim of the Rosh when it came to Esther when it came to Yeridea. That's how big the Rosh was. He's a mass posek. He was a very big time in Chacham. The Rosh writes, you know the time in Chacham? Shetorato umanato. That is, Torah is the main part of his life. He learns Torah day and night. He works very little for Parnassah, only what he needs, and he gets back to his learning right away. Meaning to say a person that works a few hours a day just for his parasa and he gets back to his learning and he learns day and night and he's not the type of guy to go after all Amazan and always be out there and so on and so forth. He says such a person is considered a Tamil Chacham. A person that's shokel or doubt Torah. And if a person disgraces such an individual, he says a person loses his chilek in Olam Abba. He mamash loses his share in Olam Abba. The Chida writes something very interesting. He says, Et Hashem Iran. It says you have to fear your God. It says et. We know every time the Torah says et, it's coming to include something. What is it coming to include? Rabbi Kiva says it's coming to include Tamidei Chachamim. The question is what's so great that HaKadosh Baruch who wanted to put his fear and he wanted to include the Tamidei Chachamim a part of the fear of Hashem. Meaning to say whenever it says you have to fear God, it says the word et to include Tamidei Chachamim that people have to be fearful and respectful of Tamidei Chachamim like they fear Hashem. He says, why did HaKadosh Baruch Hu bring up the cover of Tamad Nechamim so much? For what reason? Because Ed is coming to be the Rabot. So, so in the Gemara, I of Shimon Amstoni, I remember what it was. He used to make a drashan, all the Eds in the Torah, until he got to the Ed Hashem Rokeh Chetira, you have to fear God. He said, Ed, who can the Torah be including in the word Ed that you have to fear this person like you fear God? And then the Chamim came along and said, it's talking about Tamad Nechamim. When the word et is a rebuy, every time the Torah says the word et, it's coming to include something. It's called the rebuy. Right? And the Gemara, the Tanad Biliyahu says, anybody that gives even a gift to a time in Chacham, it's as if he's bringing Bikurim to the Beit HaMikdash. But what? The Chida says, you know why? He says, Hakolu la'avodat Hashem akiyu mitzvotav. Everything is for the purpose of avodat Hashem. He says, because if the Tamad and Chachamim are going to be chashuv in people's eyes, What's going to happen? People are going to bring them up. People are going to respect him. I saw Rabusa one time brought. Why is it that Hashem made Moshe Rabbeinu and Rav Yudha Nasi very wealthy? They were both very, very rich. Why? He says because he, they, Hashem knew that in order for the Torah to transfer to the people, the, those two figures which transfer the Torah Shebikhtav and Torah Shebapeh, they needed to be respectful figures. Otherwise, people wouldn't listen to them. That when people are respectful figures, when people are Hoshe figures, people listen to them. But a person that says, Chokhmat misken bezuyan. If a person is nobody in your eyes, he could be very bright, he could be very big. But if he's nobody in your eyes, you're not going to listen to him. He could speak all he wants, but if he's not important to you, you're not going to listen to him. It's a waste of words and a waste of time. He says what? He says, if people see that there's tremendous kavod for Tamil Nechachamim, and people see that people respect Tamil Nechachamim, and people love Tamil Nechachamim, people would want to be Tamil Nechachamim. People would strive to be Tamil Nechachamim. Right? And it would start from low lishma. People would want to do it for the wrong reasons. But eventually you'll get to the right reasons. But he says, But what if there's no kavod for Tamil Chachamim? And nobody cares about Tamil Chachamim. One time one rabbi told me, a very big Tamil Chacham one time told me, he's like, he's like, a lot of times the real Tamil Chachamim, a lot of times he tells me, real Tamil Chachamim, their children don't want to be Tamil Chachamim. He told me, you know why? He tells me, because they see how much their father works so hard and he does something so l'shem shamayim, and he sees that people don't value it. He doesn't want to be like that. He says, you know, when the children want to become rabbis, when they see that their parents and their father gets everything, he gets a lot of kavod and a lot of everything, he says, oh, their children want to become rabbis. 
Right? It starts Shelo Lishma. It might start for the wrong reasons, but it gets to Lishma. That if a Ben Torah, if a Tamid Chacham is a respected figure, it creates more that a Kaddish Baruch Hu, people would want to be Tamid Chachamim. And the Chida says that if people don't respect Tamid Chachamim, eventually the Tamid Chachamim also give up on speaking. Tamid Chacham gets up, he wants to say something. He wants to stop something from happening, or he wants to make something happen. But if he knows nobody's going to listen, nobody's going to care. And that's what happened during the time of the Beit HaMikdash, Shechida says. It got to a point where people didn't care what the rabbis had to say, so the rabbis didn't say anything, and eventually the Beit HaMikdash was destroyed. Many people were murdered, and everybody went into Galut. He brings something very, very scary over here. He brings something very, very scary over here. He brings the, the story with, with Zechariah. It says over here that Zechariah was a very chashuv person, right? He was the chatan of the king. He was a kohen gadol, he was an avin, a dayan. He had all the, anything that you can imagine. And he felt a very strong privilege to speak a little bit too strong to the people. One day he got up, he was speaking very strong to the people. The people got upset, what did they do? They stoned him to death. He said, Rabbi, Enough. And they killed him. Where did they kill him? In the Beit HaMikdash. It says they killed him in the Beit HaMikdash. And it says not only in the Beit HaMikdash, they killed him on Shabbat and on Yom Kippur. Why? Because he was talking too much. They didn't like what he was saying. This, this is how the generation there was. There. This is the, the point where they got up. That they just didn't want to accept what he's going to say. It says when it was Aradan came, and he started to conquer Yerushalayim. He came to the Beit HaMikdash. He sees in the Beit HaMikdash, he sees blood boiling. He asked him, whose blood is this? He says, oh, this is from the Korbanot. He felt something was suspicious. He brought kor, he brought animals, he shechted them, he compared the blood, he said, it doesn't look the same. He told me, tell me the truth, what happened here? He says, tell you the truth, he was a Navi, that the people already got tired of them. He always used to come and rebuke us and tell us what to do. We were tired of what he had to say. We just killed him and that's it. We wiped him out. Life moves on quietly. Oh, once Nebuzaradan heard this, he said, you know what? I'm going to calm down all this blood. He took the Sanhedrin and he killed the whole Sanhedrin. And the, but in that area, he killed the whole Sanhedrin. And he made their blood flow over that blood. And he saw the blood of Zechariah was still um, bubbling. Was still bubbling. He said, he said he doesn't understand. The blood was still not calm. That means that the generation still did not get a kapara for what they did. He took a whole bunch of single boys and single girls. He shechted them and killed them. Also, the blood was covered. He killed hundreds of thousands of people. Blood was covered everywhere. Zechariah's blood was still bubbling. He brought children. He murdered thousands of children. Nothing. The blood was still bubbling. He murdered 80,000 young Kohanim. And he put all their blood in the Beit HaMikdash to try to calm down the blood of Zechariah. And he, he was bothering him. And the blood of Zechariah kept bubbling like, like lava, like it wouldn't stop. And he said, the blood was still the Zechariah. So, Nebuzar Adan said, Zechariah, Zechariah, I killed all the good ones. He says, is this enough for you? Should I kill everybody? He said, at that moment, the blood stopped. Once Nebuzar Adan saw this, he's like, can you imagine for one Chacham, the Jewish people killed, how much of a kapara they needed? Imagine how many people I killed. Nebuzar Adan left everybody and he went to convert. He got scared. He went and he converted. And the Ramban says over here, you see from here, that this avirah that they had, is this avirah that they had, how much of a kapara they needed in order to give him a kapara? How much of a kapara they needed in order to give a kapara? Then end of the story, there was a sefer called Minchat Yehuda by Rav Yudha Fataya, and Parsha Jecheskel, he brings a lot of stories over there of Ruchot Ra'ot, bad spirits that travel around in this world. The Baba Sali used to tell all those them to read the sefer. Right? And not everybody can handle it. Right, but it's a true, it's a true sefer that was written maybe like 67 years ago, maybe a little bit more. Rav Yehuda Fatai was one of the biggest mukubalim. He got smicha from from uh, Rav Abdullah Somech when he was 17. Rav Avadja personally knew him, and he said that he knows personal stories with him about taking bad spirits out of people. Rav Avadja said this about him. At one point, Rav Avadja's Harus's wife had a spirit inside her. She had to go to Rav Yehuda Fatai, and Rav Avadja said this whole story himself. But I don't want to get into that story. Now he speaks over there about different spirits that wander around in the world and go inside people. He said, 
That's just an idea. If you want to read the book, they translated it in English. It's called Minchat Yehuda Parshat Jecheskel. He has a lot of stories over there, very interesting stories. Right? He brings over here that the one time there's a city like 200 years ago called Koznitz. And over there, there was this one guy, this one boy, a spirit went inside of him and made him crazy. It made him crazy. The review of Atai actually brings a whole bunch of symptoms of how you can know if a person has a spirit inside of him. But anyways, right? So it says over there, the spirit made this guy crazy. They didn't know what to do with him. So they brought, they wanted to bring him to the Rebbe, but he didn't want to go. He said, no, I can't go. They brought him to the Rebbe. They forced him in. He didn't want to look at the Rebbe. The Rebbe was sitting him, telling him, look at me. He didn't want to look at him. And the Rebbe told him, who are you? And the spirit told him, why do you want to know who I am? He told me, tell me who you are, I want to fix you. Rabbi Yudha Fatai brings in a safer that he used to fix them. He used to make different tikkunim in order to fix those souls. They were not even zochet to go to Gehilam, those souls. They used to wander around for up to a thousand years. They could just wander around. And this soul that went into this boy, the Rebbe got it out of him. He told him, you know who I am? He's like, I was the guy who threw the first stone at Zechariah Anavi. He said, till today I can't get into Gehilam. I'm just flying around and the bad angels are going after me and torturing me and tormenting me. Already 2,000 years, more than 2,000 years, the bad angels are just flying around and tormenting him and torturing him. And he said this boy was the only boy that he was able to come inside and stay safe that the angels should leave him alone. That's how much he says from here, you see how, how much it is. The first guy who threw the stone at Zechariah, till today he's suffering. So many years. People take it lightly. People think that it's just nothing. People don't realize that the B'nai Turan, the Tamil Khamim of the generation, are the future of the whole change in the next generation. If the B'nai Torah don't feel appreciated and don't feel loved and don't feel needed in a community and they leave, the community will be left with nothing. What Shuvah? What He died already. If a person that Shuvah is one thing, but a person that disgraces the Tamil Chacham, it's not easy to make Shuvah. You really need serious Shuvah. Because at that moment, if a rabbi is sitting and talking, and you come and tell somebody, John Gavrit on his night, you make fun of him, at that moment you lost your Olam Haba. So Shulchan Aruch says, a person that disgraces the time of Chacham, he loses his chilek on Olam Haba. It could be you have a nates in the morning. doesn't mean anything. But the person has to be very careful. The Avid, yeah. I'm talking about Masechah Belakot, when I've been down a story, how one person spoke crazily about Masechah with the murder. He said about a rabbi. He says a part of the ceiling fell, deep, deep fell, split his head in half, right in there, on the spot. That's different. Today, to, today, today we don't... I love you, Rabbi. Today, today we don't have such a to get punished right away. Because this brochu, sometimes a person, right, life could take a very big toll on a person. Chaim Palachi writes in his Sefer that he saw many people... He saw several people that disgraced Tamid Chachamim, and in the course of their lives, they, they fell apart in life completely, financially and everything. Why? People don't realize. They make an Avera, they think they have to get punished, nothing happens, nothing happens. In the course of years, 5 years, 10 years, 15 years, and 15 years from now, Kaddish Baruch Hu could punish somebody for what he did 15 years ago. And not only punishment, reward also. A person can do something today, and in 20 years from now, it could be Zohan. Right, the Gemara says the person that loves Tamid Chachamim, his children are going to be Tamid Chachamim. If a person fears Tamid Chachamim, respects Tamid Chachamim, his Chatanim going to be Tamid Chachamim. And a person, what? No, no, you have to ask the person himself. That's between you and Hashem. You cannot ask Hashem to forgive you for something you did to somebody else. How can I come to you, hurt your feelings, steal money from you? And then go ask Hashem, please forgive me for hurting him. What does that have to do with me and Hashem? Hashem has to go to him. But I didn't do anything to Hashem. You have to ask for Mechila. Depends how you did it. If you did it publicly, ask for Mechila publicly. If you did it privately, you have to ask for Mechila privately. The Rambam has a whole section how these two people in Mechila. Uh, they do Mechila. The Shulchan Aruch writes that a time of Chacham is allowed to put somebody in Cherem and Nidoy if somebody disgraced him, but he shouldn't do it. For his own kavod. It's a whole big sugi in of itself. But the point being is, it's not the point. The point being is, if, if you really want the generation to develop and become stronger, to create a stronger future generation for you and for your children, B'nai Torah is something that has to be valued in a community. B'nai Torah cannot be brought into a community and feel like we're not wanted here and then leave. Go to Monte and go to Lakewood and, and lose them by the masses. Lose them by the masses. And then everybody is... Uh, Looking to pick one out to come, come give a shear, come give a shear. There's nobody there, nobody, everybody ran away. Right? You have to, you have to value the B'nai Torah that are in the community. If you want the community to develop, to build, 
You need to value the Torah that's being developed in the community. It's common sense. If the B'nai Torah don't feel valued, they feel degraded, they feel belittled, they don't feel wanted, they're going to leave and then in 20 years from now, people's children are going to be wherever they're going to be. There's no way in the world a community to get developed properly without having a chamim. What they're going to end up with, you know they're going to end up with? Zohar rabbis. You know Zohar rabbis, one time somebody <laughs> called me, one time... One time a rabbi called me, I'm not joking, the rabbi called me, he said, I'm getting offered a position somewhere to be a rabbi. He's like, when I went there, they asked me to read Potach Eliyahu Navi. I read it nicely. He's like, when you went to your position as a rabbi, did they ask you to read Potach Eliyahu Navi? I'm looking at him, I'm thinking, can you imagine what's happening in this generation? This is what's important. How you read Potach Eliyahu Navi is important. Right? You want real Tamidich Chachamim? You want real Tamidich Chachamim? You have to value Tamidich Chachamim. Right, HaKadosh Baruch, Hu, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives rabbis of a community based on the schuyot of the community. If he loves the community, he gives you a good rabbi. If unfortunately not, then you get whoever you get, right? But HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives the community based on what they're zochet to. So therefore, in Mela, people have to understand the importance to value the Tam and the Chamim. Now I want to go back to the topic that we continued about Safrut. I know that this is not a topic for everybody because not everybody is a sofer. But it's an important topic to know. It's a chilek in the Shulchan Aruch. The Ma'am Loez writes, every person has to know, not a Tamit Chacham, every ordinary person has to know the whole Shulchan Aruch, the whole Tanakh and all of Mishnayot. At least, he says, at least. That means that everybody has to know these halachot also. They're written for everybody. So I'm just going to go into them in short. We already got, I think we did like 12 halachot last time. And now we're just going to continue going to short to differ. A person will know. When you look at a mezuzah, you go up to Sefer Torah. A lot of times, the Baal Koray goes up to the Sefer Torah. He reads the Sefer Torah. He's reading Pasulim. He doesn't even know what he's reading. He does. When I go up to the Sefer Torah and I get an Aliyah, I understand what I'm looking at. You know how many times I found in Shul's letters touching or letters that are Shinrit Surah, that are Pasul? At least three, four times. I found it when I went up for Aliyot. And I... Sometimes they took away the Sefer Torah, sometimes they didn't, right? It's very hard to admit, right? But there were times that they took it away. Happened to me here in Queens one time also, the nice Sefer Torah, the, the head of the shin was disconnected. The Baal Koray doesn't pay attention, he reads, right? But if a person knows the Alachot, he knows what it's supposed to look like, he understands what he's looking at. Also as a consumer, you go, you buy a house, you ask around, you want to know what's good in a house. You go, you buy a phone, a car, whatever it is. When you go, you buy Tfinin Mezutot, you also want to know what you're looking at. You say, I want to see what I'm looking at. You look at it, you take a look, you understand what you're looking at. You know the Chathili, you know the Bidiyabad, you know the questions to ask, you know what to request. When people come to me, I always educate them. I tell them, look, you want to know? I, I educate them everything. I tell them, this is like, this is like, ask me, what's the difference? I tell them the difference. People have to know what they're buying. People have to be educated. Right? So in Safrut, also there has to be a lakhal, that what? It says the letter must be Ketiva Taman. Right? Meaning to say that you have to write on cloth that's fully whole and cannot have holes. Now, if you have a hole inside the cloth, you have a hole inside the cloth, and you write a letter on the hole. So if you write the letter and you go through the hole one time while lighting the letter and the hole seals up, it's kosher. The hole is not visible. Right? If the hole is visible and you look at it through the sun, it's still kosher. But it's not mahudar. It's not mahudar. If it has a tiny hole and you can see through the sun... It's not mehudar, it's not the best, right? You buy something, the Ben Yishchai says, really happy alacham, if the kosher lechatkhila tefillin cost you $800, and mehudar tefillin cost you one third more, we need to say, what's one, to say $900, one third more is $300 more, $1200, if it's a mehudar one, it's $1200, happy alacham, there is room to say that you should get the mehudar one, but if it's more than one third of a lechatkhila one, you don't have to get, that's true, that's happy alacham, but the Ben Yishchai says, hidur mitzvah, uh, there's no reward for mitzvah in this world, but hidden mitzvah, a person does get reward in this world. And therefore, a person gets something, say, I want mehudar. Some people, they go, they build lavish houses, three, four million dollars, their staircase costs them ten thousand dollars, and they want to put a thirty dollar mezuzah on the door point. This is normal? It doesn't make sense to me. For the physicality, you care. For the spirituality, for the mitzvah of Hashem, it's secondary. Just like you got yourself, I don't know what kind of floors they get over there. They get $5,000 doors like this with all the stuff over there, right? And again, a $200 case and a $30 mezuzah on side. Doesn't make sense. Right? A person has to say, I want mehudar. I want the best. Everything in spirituality always has to be the best. Whenever it comes to Torah and Avodat Hashem, everything always has to be the best. Don't sell off anything less. It says that what? If you write over the, the hole and it clogs the hole one time, it's kosher. 
But if the sofer sees a hole and he goes over two, three times to close the hole, it's pasul. Why? Because every letter has to have white cloth around the letter. Right? The hole invalidates the letter. You have to be very careful. Now, what about if you wrote the letter and there was no hole? And, but sometimes what happens in the, in the cloth, the cloth is animal skin. Sometimes there's the veins that go through and when they were cleaning them, there's like little thin areas there that I have to really show it to you one time. That you could, after you finish writing, sometimes you could take a little bit, you could pick it up, and it takes off like a whole big part of the cloth and it cuts off a letter in half. Right, so you have to be careful. You have to know that if you have, if you have that little theory and it cuts off the letter in half, now you have to look at the letter to see if it's too kosher like that. You have to see how much of the letter is left. For example, I'll give you an example. Say you wrote a letter Dalit. I thought there would be a board over here. I don't know if there's a board over here. Say you wrote the letter Dalit, right? Say you wrote the letter Dalit, and then on the bottom, you realize that there's a little piece there that's, that's sticking out, so you took it out, and now it cut the letter Dalit in half. So you have to make sure that the, the, the foot of the letter Dalit has enough ink to this point to make it kosher. How much do you need? Kamale ot ketana. I need to say like this. If I have a letter Dalit, and I need a leg, the leg, lechatchila, the best preferred way, has to have two kumusim. Kumusim means as follows. I make a, a, an, a pen, right? I write one, I make like one little stroke, that's one kumus. Going downwards, I need it to be long, long enough to have to be able to look like a dalit. Even if it's a little bit short, as long as it's one kumus, they call it an alakha, one stroke of the pen, that's also considered kosher. Now, if I went and I wrote a letter and there's a hole in the middle of the letter and I see the hole in the middle of the letter, the ink didn't close it, it's not kosher. Why? Because every letter needs to be mukaf dvil. Every letter needs to have complete white around it. Now, brings another halakha. He says, being that every letter needs to have complete white around it, it also needs to have complete white inside of it. What would be the practical case? If a person is writing and he sees that there's a hole in the cloth, now he wants to write the letter Chaf Sofid. Chaf Sofid or Reish. So he writes Chaf Sofid or Reish. Inside the Chaf Sofid, inside the Reish, there's going to be a hole. He has to make sure that the letter is not touching that hole. You have to keep it distant from the hole. If there's a hole in the middle of the letter, and the actual letter is not touching the hole, that's okay. If there's a hole in the middle of the letter. right? Some people don't know anything. I've had customers that came to me. They're looking at Mrs. Ott. They're looking for 10, 15 minutes. They have no clue what they're looking at. I have no clue what they're looking at, right? And then one time somebody came to me. He started pointing out something, different things. And I see he has no clue what he's talking about. So I said, you know what? I'm going to take him for a ride. I started speaking to him on different things. And he realized himself he has no idea what he's talking about, right? But it's important to know what you're talking about. So if you have a race and you have a little hole in the middle, if that hole is not touching any part of the letter, it's okay. It's, it's, it's a completely mehudar. There's nothing wrong with it to have a little tiny hole in the cloth. However, you have to be careful. Sometimes if the hole is a little bit too close to the letter, a smart sofa, what does he have to do? In the back of the parchment, you connect another little piece of parchment with a little bit of glue, but you have to be careful, right? So therefore, when you close that fill-in, the pressure won't make the hole, won't make it bigger, and then it'll touch the letter. So even... It'll touch the letter then. It's still okay. Why? Because we said that when you write a letter, it needs to have full white cloth around it. It cannot touch that hole. That's only while you're writing the letter. But once I write a letter and it's fully white around it, if I made a little hole afterwards, that's okay. Because it only has to have the white around it when you're writing it. But once it's fully written, it's fully kosher. Even if I got a little hole afterwards, it still looks like that letter. It would be kosher. Now, if... You have a memsofit, right? Or a samech, any letter that's fully enclosed, or a hay, it's closed and it's enclosed by three sides. And you have a hole in the middle, there is a machloket between the Gemara Bavli and the Gemara Yushalmi, whether or not the inside of those letters need to also have klaf or not. Mechatchila, yes, vidyavad, it's okay if you don't have it, but it is better to. Change it. Now, also, I'm going to mention one more halakha and we'll stop with this. This halakha is very common. One of the most common things that you need to check for when looking for a mezuzan and looking for a tefillin, when you're looking through, through your own mezuzot, what do you have to look for? One of the main things, you look to make sure that the khaf is fully long. 
The reish is not too long on the bottom. The dalit is different than a zayin. Sometimes what happens is sofer, he can make a dalit and he needs to make the leg towards the end. Sometimes he can make the leg a little bit close in the middle and now the letter becomes a safek zayin. Right? Sometimes it becomes a suffix zayin. So if you have a dalit, you have the head. The leg needs to be on the right side. You all know what a dalit looks like. Say he put the leg a little bit in the middle, now you have a problem. It could look like a zayin. This is a very common problem that a sofer writes a little bit too quick. He might not pay attention. So what do you do in such a case scenario where you have a dalit where the leg came inside a little bit and might look like a zayin? You show a child. Why you show a child? You have to show a child who does not know how to read words but only knows how to read letters. Because the child doesn't understand what he's looking at. He doesn't understand what it has to be. What does the child do? A child looks at a letter and he tells you what he sees. You tell him, what letter is this? He tells you, Zion. No good. Pasul. He tells you, Dalit. It's good. A child can only tell you what he sees. He doesn't know how to think and imagine what word. He doesn't know how to put it together. An adult knows what it's supposed to be. So his mind automatically is going to lean towards what? The right thing. But a child, you give him and he looks. A chaf sofit. Very common problem. I find this a lot in Mizuzot also. That the Sofrim are not careful enough to make the Chav Sofit long. The Chav Sofit on the top needs to be long. And the leg needs to come down long. Sometimes they make the top of the Chav Sofit very short. If the top of the Chav Sofit is very short, then it becomes into a Nun Sofit. It becomes Pasum. Therefore also another thing you have to make sure that the heads of the Chav Sofit are going to be long enough. Also... A lot of people don't know, halakha, that the head of the Zion, if it's too big, even though the leg is in the middle, it's also pasul. It's also pasul. It loses its status of being a Zion. This is the way Rabbi Wallen Paskins in the Yeru Yachnamo. Okay, I guess we'll stop over here a little bit. We'll continue next week. Okay.